In this video, we are going to go through how to calculate the power for a binomial distribution or how to set up a trial um, where we're going to evaluate the results using the binomial distribution and then be able to calculate the power or the number of samples needed in order to reach a certain power. So the learning objectives is that you should know that a true difference a true difference is not always statistical detectable due to the sample size. Understand that the statistical power depends on sample size, effect size and uncertainty in the data. And then be able to make reasonable assumptions and estimate the power for an experimental design for the binomial distribution. So here's a small example. I have a hypothesis that males on average are higher than females. I'm making experiments to compare the height of five females and five males. Then I do a test and it reveals a p-value of 0.3. And I conclude that there seems to be no difference between the height of males and females. So the question here is, what is the problem? So try to pause the video and think about it for a while. The problem here is that there is indeed differences between the height of males and the height of females on average. But this setup is simply too small to capture it. So we get a p-value which says it's not unlikely that I go out and sample five females and five males and then that they could be from the same distribution. So in order to reach statistical power we need to include enough samples so that we will be able to conclude what is truly different between the two populations. So here we have the two types of errors which we deal with in statistics. So we have type 1 error and type 2 error. And, and here, we have, here we have the test and that is based on data we either accept the null hypothesis or we reject the null hypothesis. So this is the test. And then we have the truth, which we by definition don't know, but let's assume that we do actually know the truth. And then we can say, well, if the accepted uh, um, null, null hypothesis is uh, correct, that we, based on data, say that there is no difference and there indeed is no difference, then we will talk about having a correct true negative. If we reject the null hypothesis and there is indeed, the truth tells us that there is indeed difference, then we talk about correct true positive. So that is the two situations where there is alignment between the test and the truth. Then there is two off there is the case where there is no difference between the two populations and where we, based on data, reject the null hypothesis and say, well, there is a difference. We call this a type 1 error. And we can think about it as being, well, we have a test which tries to figure out whether you are sick, whether you are guilty, whether you are doped, and it tells us that you are sick, guilty, and dope, but in reality you are not. So you can, especially for the guilty and the sick and the doped example here, you can imagine that we really wish this error to be low. We do not want to go out and say, well, you are sick, you're going to die in two days, if the, the fact is that you are indeed healthy. So this is the type 1 error. We symbolize that with an alpha, and this is false positive. On the other hand, we can have the case where there is indeed difference, where you are sick, where you are guilty, where you are doped, but the test is not powerful enough to capture it. So we will say, well, we accept the null hypothesis and say healthy, not guilty, not doped. This type of error we term type 2 error, we, we use the symbol beta for it and call it false negatives. So, we control the type 1 error by choosing a conservative value of alpha. 
So we set alpha to 0.05 or 0.01 in order to say, well, we need very strong statistical support in order to reject the null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is true, that is this blue line here, then if we go above a critical value visualized as here, then we would reject our null hypothesis wrongly. And that is this area here, because we have a true null hypothesis. On the other hand, if we have the alternative hypothesis being true, so here it's not centered around zero, but around another value, here three, we will say, well, sometimes, and most of the times, we will also get data response, which is in this area where we would um, reject the null hypothesis and conclude difference. But sometimes we will also have data which gives results ending up down here, below the critical value. And then we would wrongly accept the null hypothesis, because we are in this area, and say there's no difference. So this one, the type 2 error, we control that by making the design big enough. So this is controlled by choosing a conservative significance level, and this is controlled, the type 2 error is controlled by having enough samples. So how is this done for the binomial distribution? So I say, well, I have x, it's binomially distributed, there's n trials and a p parameter p. So first of all, I need to state my question. So the question is, is the difference and that I formulate as no difference. So I state that as p equal to p0. And I have an intuitive hypothesis, which in this case is that p is larger than p0. Then I set and this is critical. I set an expected proportion. It's not thumb, something that I derive from data, it's something that I set. Q and Q here is on the alternative hypothesis. It is where Q is larger than P0. Then I set an N, say, well, how many trials am I going to con conduct? 20, for instance. Then I find the least x where the test is significant under the null hypothesis. So what is the least number of correct answers I should have in order to reject the null hypothesis? Then I calculate the probability of getting this x, this least number of positive answers, or what is more extreme, given that the expected proportion is true under the alternative hypothesis. Then I change n up here until the desired power is reached. Okay, let's try and do this for the triangle test. So I have x is the number of correct answers in In a triangle test, x x is binomially distributed with n by p. So the null hypothesis is that if you are served free samples and you don't know which one is which, and I should say, well, which one is the odd one? Is it this one, this one, and this one? If I am guessing, then my p is equal to p0, which is equal to one third. The alternative is that p is larger than p0. So a proportion which is larger than one third. Okay, now I set a number of trials. I say, well, n is equal to 20. And what I wish to do is, I wish to calculate the probability of x being larger than or equal to a small number x. This one is equal to 1 minus p of x being less than or equal to x minus 1. 
and this value should be less than alpha. So what I should do is I should go in and figure out should x be 10, should x be 8, 9, 11 and so forth in order to reach significance. So let's try and see how this is done in R. We say n is equal to 20, p0 is equal to 1 divided by 3 and I want to calculate the number of the least significant um, number of correct answers in order to achieve, achieve significance. So I use the p binome function and n by, by p0 and then I try to set in a value here. For instance, I put in 9 and this would be the value, the p value under the null hypothesis if I have 9 correct answers. So 9 is not enough in order to achieve significance. So I can change this number, 10, and then I see that if I have 10, and let's just see how the formula is, if I have an x which is x minus 1, so 10 is actually 11 minus 1. So let's try to put in this one here. So 11 minus 1 then I have significance. I could also, so so now I know if I have 20 trials, I need 11 of them to be significant in order to reach significance. So 11 of them should answer correctly in order to achieve significance. I can do this in another way. I can define a vector from one up to n. So I could say, well, I can have either one, two, three, up to 20 correct answers. And then I can put in n here, x here, and then I'll get p-values for all these different possibilities. And then I can search for which one of these are less than a significance level of 0 0.05. And I can say, well, let's see which of x fulfills this, and that is 11, 12, and so forth. Okay. So now I know that in order to achieve significant, x needs to be larger than or equal to 11 at alpha equals to 0 0.05. So now I know at least 11 correct answers will give me significance if n is 20. So now let's calculate the power. But in order to calculate the power, I need to uh, assume an expected proportion in the population that are actually capable of answering correctly. So in this case, let me call that P1 and let me set that to a half. So this is my alternative and say, well, I think based on knowledge and previous studies that half of the people, half of the 20 judges would be able to answer correctly. Some of them will be guessing, some of them will actually be able to taste differences, but half of them will answer correctly. So I will expect at least 10 of them uh, to return a correct answer. So now... I should calculate the probability of achieving a higher value than 11 under this um, assumption. So this is 1 minus p of x is less than or equal to 11 minus 1. Simply just rewriting this one. This is 1 minus p binom 11 minus 1, comma n, comma p1. So it looks pretty much like the calculations up here. The only thing that's changed is the p1. So let's go and see how this is done. So now I have p1. 
and that's equal to a half. So I wish to calculate the probability of achieving at least 11. So that's 11 minus 1, and I have this one in front, at n equal to 20, and now p1. So this returns me the probability is equal to 0 0.41. And this is actually equal to 1 minus beta. So this is what we call the power. Or 1 minus the power. One, this is the power value, 1 minus the type 2 error. So I've, if I'm not satisfied with this number, saying, well, this means that if I conduct a trial with 20 persons involved, and there is a probability of them tasting differences is one half, then 40% of the times I will not be able to conclude that they are actually capable of tasting differences, which I know they can, at least from the assumption here. So in order to achieve a higher, a higher value of the power, I need to either set this one up or be more optimistic about this one. So let's try to do either. So I can tune I can tune this one and say, well, instead of using P1 being a half, I could set it to two thirds. And you'll see that the power increases dramatically. Obviously, this could be a too optimistic assumption, so it might not be valid. Another possibility is to recalculate the entire bunch and say, well, I go back here and say I would like to calculate where I change n to something else. In order to make this exercise more simple, I've arranged it in a script. So here is my settings. I have n equals to 20, p0 one third, significance level of 0 0.05, and an alternative hypothesis of a half. Then I make the vector of the possi possible correct answers, and I calculate the p-values, and collect the p-values which are lower than alpha. And then I figure out what is the least number of correct samples that I need, and that I term xm, in order to achieve significance. Achieving significance is here, and the least number of samples is here. Then I calculate the power by simply using this number in a binomial distribution with the alternative hypothesis. And this is the power then. So if I change the number here, for instance, to 30, and rerun the entire bunch, I'll get another power here. So you see that the power increases to 0 0.5. 5, 7, and if I go even higher, you'll see that the power continue increasing. And if we make it extreme, then 60 samples will achieve a power of 0 0.82. So in this way, you can simply rerun your entire calculations by simply just changing a single value up here. So I hope that you, by this small example, know the nuts and bolts for calculating power for the binomial distribution, that it involves knowing the null hypothesis, but also to assume something about the population. If they are actually capable of tasting differences, what does that mean? Is P1 equal to 1, meaning that everybody is able to taste differences, or is it just slightly higher than the guessing probability, for instance, by half. And then it's two probability calculations, one for figuring out the least number of correct answers under the null hypothesis in order to reject it, 11 in this case, and then a probability calculation for that number given the alternative, and that will reveal the power.